How would you uh, how would you characterize the Seahawks coaching search so far? Uh, I mean, I would say it is truly open at this point. Um, you know, John Schneider's waited 14 years to run a coaching search himself. He's you know always prepared to be able to move forward here. And I think that they kind of really value within the organization, the opportunity to get a lot of different perspectives. I mean, Pete Carroll's, you know, a, an all time great coach and he won a Super Bowl. He's won, you know, obviously at the college level as well. Consistently, the Seahawks were one of the best teams in the league. Um, and, and you heard that, you know, from Schneider at the press conference talking about how they got a clear directive from ownership to keep that positive culture and the things that, that Pete has built, but you know, now you move forward and you're, you know, trying to figure out who is going to best fit into that and help you take the next step. So most of the names we've heard are current coordinators somewhere. In fact, I think all the names we've heard that they're actually interviewing are current coordinators. Is that because they need to ask permission for those guys? And so those are the only names we would hear, or is it because they just haven't interviewed Vrabel, Harbaugh, names like that where, where they wouldn't necessarily have to ask permission? I'm not aware of them interviewing those two specific guys, Jim Harbaugh or Mike Vrabel. I don't – listen, you never say never on anything in this, but I don't really anticipate it going that direction. Um, and, you know, and the names that are on the list, I think, are, you know, really good ones, even if they may not be household names. I mean, Patrick Graham was in there yesterday. Um, you know, he's a guy who's coached under a lot of really great coaches, including Bill Belichick. He, you know, coached under Mike McCarthy in Green Bay. Um, he, he's been a lot of different places. The second half of this year, you know, Antonio Pierce obviously did a great job and earned the Raiders head coaching position, but it was Patrick Graham's defense that was shutting everybody down. He's a, a Yale guy. He's really, really intelligent. He mixes things up. Um, you know, he coaches players hard, but they respect him for it. Uh, you know, he's somebody who you know profiles the head coach. He was a finalist in Minnesota a couple of years ago. Uh, today they got Mike Kafka in the building. And I understand, you know, the giants offense didn't exactly light it up this year with Daniel Jones injured once again. And, you know, Saquon getting hurt in the early going and all those different things. But, you know, Mike was a finalist for two jobs last year. He got second interviews for, for two different positions, the former player, you know, there's reasons that he's in that mix. You know, I, I understand there's gonna be a lot of focus too on Dan Quinn. He is certainly a candidate. I believe he's there uh, tomorrow. And then, you know, Raheem Morris, Sadro Overo, I wouldn't be surprised if they double back on some of these coaches that are still in the playoffs as well. So yeah, we're early in this process. I know, you know, I'm sure people get nervous when they see, you know, other teams like Tennessee swooping in and hiring Brian Callahan. Well, you know, the Seahawks situation was a little bit different in terms of when they, you know, made that move and what they're looking for in the head coach. I think that they're going to take their time. You know, it's not to say they can't make a hire this week, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if we get into at least <laughs> next week and they continue to consider their options to keep those conversations going. It is. Uh, we're talking to Tom Pelissero, NFL Network here on Brock and Salk. It is interesting. Maybe not Harbaugh, but Vrabel does seem like a name that would fit with John Schneider. And I think there's a lot of folks here, myself included, that think he would be a very interesting uh, person to come and, and, and take over for Pete Carroll. Some of their similarities, but also some of their differences. Why, why do you think that's not a direction they've looked, if that's the case? Well, listen, I'd say Mike Vrabel is a very good coach. He's been the NFL coach of the year. Um, you know, he's found ways to get the most out of his talent. He's an expert in the nuances of the rules. Obviously, former player does a good job in terms of, you know, how, you know his leadership traits. I think that coming from Pete Carroll, you know, you're, you're probably talking about a pretty drastic cultural swing if you're you're going to a Mike Vrabel. You know, there's probably more. I think anybody who grew up in the New England culture, there's a little bit more negative reinforcement that's there. Whereas with Peter, you know, with Pete, it was, you know, kind of that positive reinforcement type of culture. Also, Pete was big on celebrating the individual. I don't really know that that's, you know, kind of the way that Mike Vrabel runs things. And again, that's not saying that the Seahawks are looking for a carbon copy of Pete Carroll, but you really need to be conscientious. You know, this is not a, a franchise that, I mean, shoot, they're not New England that went four and 13 this year. They're not the Titans that lost 18 of their last 24 games under Mike Vrabel, which I think, you know, people need to remember there's a lot of factors in that, including personnel, but they weren't winning uh, toward the end of it. When you've got a group that that seems to be, you know, a step away because they've rebuilt the Seahawks roster. You look at the young talent that they've got, especially at the skill spots, especially on defense. 
know, I think it's fair to say they probably underachieved last year. But you're not thinking, let's rip it down and start over. You're very much thinking, we just need somebody here to put us over the top. Again, you never say never on any of this. I just don't know that I view Mike Vrabel personally, my opinion, as a fit for what Seattle is probably ultimately looking for. It's interesting, uh, you know, when when fans, and I'll put myself in that category, start start looking at what's available. I think all we really know about these guys, unless they've been a head coach before, is what they are as a coordinator, right? Are they smart? Are they creative? We don't really know a lot about, as you said, Patrick Graham, other than how he did with his defense there with the Raiders. And yet, you ask anybody, what's the most important trait for a head coach? Everyone says leadership and culture building and communication. And generally, X's and O's comes after that. How, as as fans, can we, and maybe there's just no answer to this, but how do we get to know who could actually do the things that head coaches need to be able to do? That's a great question. And I think that's why if you're the Seahawks and you haven't had to, you know, hire a coach, I mean, they've never hired a coach since the rules changed. You know, you look at all the different mandates and the interview cadence and everything is different now than it was back in in 2010 you need to spend time and get time around people you know go out to dinner with them have them meet with a variety of different people in in your building go through all the football stuff too but there's a lot of non-football things uh, that are part of this as well a big part of it too is you know making sure that you understand um you know what you know the background on that person what do people think of them that they've worked with what were their actual duties in another building now i tell you this and this is not unique to john schneider the seahawks or anybody else a lot of teams do this i mean i get calls all day from you know people around the league all the way down from hey this head coach being candid what do you think of him down to hey i'm considering this guy for a db's coach what have you heard because everybody wants to make sure they don't miss something they want to make sure they've got the most information possible it is not an exact science there's a reason that half of all head coaches are fired within three years because, you know, yeah, there's a lot of times where no matter how good of a coordinator you are, it may not translate to being an effective head coach. So, you know, I think that there's every team's going to have different criteria. Every team is going to um, be trying to identify different traits in their coaches. Would Dan Campbell have been as successful if he took a job in, I'm trying to remember who else was in that coaching cycle, let's say Atlanta, as, as he was when he took the Detroit job? I don't know. He's the perfect guy for Detroit. He played there. He he fits. He knows the city. The people have embraced him. If you you plunked him into a different spot, or maybe you couldn't lose all the games Dan Campbell lost for his first year and a half, maybe he would have been fired. Maybe he would have been the one gone. These are the things that are really really tricky tricky because there are environmental factors that play into this. And you know, again, just to to bring it back to the Seahawks, they've got to look for the Seahawks' next head coach. Not the guy that everybody else wants. Not the right coach for the Chargers. If Bill Belichick ends up in Atlanta and Jim Harbaugh ends up in L.A. and the Seahawks end up with somebody else, that doesn't mean the Seahawks made the wrong decision. It means, you know, they're trying to fit the right environment to the right coach. Um, You know, and I think that at this point, you know, John Schneider, that front office, have, you know, earned, I think, the, you know, the the right to – you know, for people to believe that they're going to be able yeah. to get this thing right because you don't have as much longstanding, um, you know, tradition of winning like they have. And Pete, of course, is a big part of it too. But you don't build a culture with that level of success sustained if you're not a good judge of people, a good judge of coaches, a good judge of what's the best thing for your building. Yeah, I'll admit there's a big part of me that would be very excited if they went with someone I don't know that much about, whether it's Mike Kafka or Patrick Graham or Aviro from from Carolina, even more so than sort of the the name brand candidates like uh, Mike McDonald or, or Ben Johnson, just because it would tell me that they weren't just going for the best coordinator. They were going for somebody that had some specific skill or blew them away, like, uh, you know, kind of like the Dan Campbell story or like the story of Mike Tomlin back in the day. No, I totally agree. And you're also thinking, okay, for the team that you've built too. I mean, this is not, like I said, this is not a reboot culturally. It's also not a reboot personnel wise. I mean, look at the talent that they've got right now on offense. Look at the talent that they've got on defense, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. And again, this is not in any way, 
um, to be a negative on Pete Carroll, but you know, he's defensive background head coach. That's been his calling card for a long time. And last year for everything they put into that defense, they just weren't good. You know, was that Pete, was that the rest of the coaching staff? Was that player development? You know, it's, it's probably a combination of a lot of different things, but you're trying to figure out what's going to bring out the best in this team, not just in 2024, but beyond. So yeah, there's some guys who aren't household names. I actually do a series for NFL Network where I go around, try to identify some of those coaches early, um, do a feature just to show their personality. So I did one with uh, Adrian Overo. I mean, I, I tweeted it the other day. People can go look at it. Watch that three minutes and tell me you can't get excited about this guy coming in. Nobody knew, I think, publicly, at least prior to last year when he got the Broncos defensive coordinator job, who the guy was. But there's a reason he's had, I believe, eight head coaching interviews over the last two years here and has been a finalist has gotten a second interview for several of them because he's a really good football coach who amidst the hardest circumstances possible. I mean, think about this, Mike, Adrian Overo might be the first coordinator, at least the only one I can remember who's been on two consecutive teams that fired their head coach before the end of year one, yet still in both cases had a top five defense. That doesn't happen. I mean, so he's doing something right. I know they don't want to let him out of Carolina. He, he's a real candidate, and I think Raheem is too. Dan Quinn, Kafka, Pat Graham. And, you know, I would not, again, be surprised if, you know, a Ben Johnson or maybe a Mike McDonald, but that one's more complicated because they can't talk to him until the Ravens are out. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those guys gets brought back too. And there's a lot of different directions this could go. They're going to take their time. It's exhausting. We've been having a lot of fun with it, but it, 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 you know, you can certainly see how you can go down any of these roads and be like, "Well, that would be exciting," and that guy sounds pretty good, and this seems Think like a pretty good offense. Spoiled you and your I listeners know. are Mike. You we are spoiled. Had to talk about this. You know how many teams have gone through like five coaching searches? The yes. Browns have probably gone through seven. <laughs> the Panthers have gone through a bunch. Like how many coaching searches since 2010? Everybody else is used to this, even though again, it's sort of fun. The rules change, but. It's kind of yeah, it's I mean, kind of fun to see what's out there. I mean, I don't think it's something you want to be doing every year, but it is sort of entertaining to do it once and and sort of talk about some of these names and get to know them a little bit. You know, the last guy who called Seattle sports fans spoiled, of course, was Jeff Passan. He was referring to the Mariners fans, and they were not wild about that characterization, given you know the lack of World Series and championships, etc. around here. So I think we'll take it when it comes to the Seahawks. It's a very different I mean, the situation. Seahawks, I want to say in fourteen in the last fourteen years since Pete and John got there, I believe they have played a grand total. You know, somebody can fact check me on this, but I believe they've played a grand total of two games yep. where they were eliminated. Isn't that crazy? Two games in 14 years where they were out every year. They're in it at the end, but you know what? The, the ultimate goal is another Super Bowl. They, they haven't won a Super Bowl in a decade. Um, you know, getting to nine wins, 10 wins, 11 wins, and, you know, being out in the divisional playoffs or the wild card round, you know, that's, that's not the ultimate goal. That's, that's a high degree of success, man. Like I'm taking absolutely zero hmm. away from Pete here. So, so strange point, thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Everybody's got to make the, everybody's got to make decisions about what gets us over the top. And, you know, Jody Allen made the decision that, you know what, it, it's time. It's time to try something else. They want to keep a lot of the things in place, but Maybe a new voice is that that X factor that gets you over the top. All right, let me ask you about one little guy, and then I know you got to run, so I'll let you go. But for whatever reason, the national view seems to be, and I'm sort of lumping all of the national guys together, which is unfair, but a lot of the national view seems to be that Dan Quinn is the front runner for this job. And of all of the candidates whose names have been mentioned, that feels like the one that in town here in Seattle has generated the least amount of excitement. I don't know that I can tell you exactly why other than maybe just sort of the troubles in Dallas at the end of the year, or maybe that he's been here before and it feels like sort of Pete light. Do you think Dan Quinn is the favorite as so many others do? I, I don't think that there is a favorite right now in Seattle. That's, that's my honest opinion. Obviously um, John and a lot of other people in that building know Dan Quinn, uh, you know, it was there for the glory years with the Legion of boom he is a really, really good football coach. He knows culture. He's adaptable. You look at the scheme they're running right now, you know, in Dallas, it's not the, the Seattle scheme. I mean, he has changed and evolved. Um, and, and it certainly sounds like, you know, again, they're bringing him back for a second interview tomorrow. He is very much in the thick of this thing. But I, this is not going to be, put it this way, to the extent that people might think, 
or that anybody might be implying that this is all just doing a search with a predetermined conclusion. I, I can tell you with a high degree of confidence that's not the case. Maybe Dan Quinn ends up being the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks, but everyone who's in that building, there's not checking boxes. They're not thinking Rooney rule. They're not thinking about anything else. Every coach they're bringing through there that has gotten to the second interview, they believe could be the guy for Seattle. And so, again, they're going to spend a lot of time with all these guys through the course of this week. It quite possibly could extend into next week. If Mike McDonald emerges, uh, cover your ears. If you want this thing to end, we might be after the Super Bowl <laughs> without a, a head coach formally being named uh, in Seattle. But I think that the next, the next, let's call it seven days, will be critical here. Um, you know, we'll see where they come out on the other side. This is great. Thank you so much for doing this, Tom. We really appreciate it. I know you've been super busy, and honestly, you've just been on top of all of this, just the go-to guy this coaching cycle. So thank you so much for uh, spending a few minutes. Let's talk again, and I'm sure we'll see you uh, come August as uh, as their training camp. I missed four calls while I was on with you. So just so you know, if I get beat on something in the next hour, it's your fault, Mike. All right, yeah, stupid Garofalo is going to break news. That's it. See you, Tom. Yeah, there you exactly. go. There's Tom Pelissero, right, who does a really fantastic